News First, Newsline Prime with Faraz Shaukat Ali. Well, good evening to you. You are watching Newsline Prime. Unfortunately, Mr. Faraz Shaukat Ali could not be here with us this <coughs> evening as he's uh, not so well. But we have an interesting guest here in the studio. A uh, guest who is coming here on our Newsline program for the first time, Mr. Prakash Shafter, Chairman of Janashakti Insurance, and he's also he has also received a post in a state bank recently. We're going to talk to him about that as well. We promise you today's show will be interesting because Mr. Prakash Shafter is not only here to talk to you about the economic situation in the country, but about Sri Lanka cricket as well. Thank you, Mr. Shafter, for being here with us this evening. My pleasure. So let's start off uh, straight away um, with a little bit about yourself. Now, from what we know about Prakash Shaft, the ja uh, chairman of Janashakti Insurance, um, we know that you have not been in the country um, for a long time. You have come back and uh, you now you have your uh, business established. Uh, your business is as famous as your name. Uh, <laughs> but tell us a bit about your story and how this all began. Okay. Um I was not in the country a long, long time ago. So I left Sri Lanka when I was six and a half. Amu, I was taken out of Sri Lanka by my parents, and we as a family literally moved to South India. I did all of my primary education there, and um, then after my primary education, we were, as a family, moved to the UK. We were there then again for six years and returned to Sri Lanka in 1992. So I was literally 25 years old when I came here and had been out of the country for close to 19 years. Um, my father had a business here, it was a small insurance broking company and I started work there along with my brothers who returned to Sri Lanka and uh, then got into the swing of the Sri Lankan corporate world. Uh, Mr. Shafter, when, obviously when you're studying overseas you'll be able <coughs> to tell me a bit about uh, the education sphere as well because now when you're studying overseas and when you come back and see what's happening here uh, maybe a comparison if so to speak uh, with regard to the education as well uh, it's difficult to make comparisons and probably unfair but bearing the experiences that I had I studied in uh, what is now known as Chennai formerly Madras and uh, I can compare the education that I had there, I went to normal middle class schools and I can compare it with what I see here. I didn't study here, though my children studied here. So the huge difference that I see is the fact that in South India you had an English medium of education. Mm. That makes a huge difference to the ultimate end product. Sri Lanka unfortunately um, had the vernacular system of education for a very long time. We made half-hearted efforts to switch a few years ago, but that really hasn't borne fruition. You're yet seeing bilingual streams and whatever else you may call it, but the fact is, except for the few international schools, you do not have English medium schools. And that means the end student that you produce is not what the mercantile sector requires. A wide belief is when uh, a person leaves Sri Lanka, migrates out of our country for education purposes or uh, for professional purposes, that person does not even think of coming back to Sri Lanka. That's the wide belief. Why did you come back? Um, when we were studying in India, we used to always come back here for the holidays. And we certainly liked Sri Lanka much more than we did India. We used to look forward to coming here. Uh, in our mindset as well, despite having studied in India, then moving to the West, we always had in our mindset the idea of coming back to Sri Lanka. So the, the thought of not coming back never took root, it never germinated. So we always looked to coming back. We knew that one day we would be back. And uh, we've got no regrets about it. Mr. Shafter, now when it comes to uh, the insurance industry, as a whole, the insurance industry is very important because it's, it goes beyond the normal banking sphere because it requires a lot of, uh, how do I call this, a very strong relationship with the person who is taking that insurance policy, mm -hmm. be it from your company or from a different company as well. There needs to be this sense of integrity, uh, this sense of uh, commitment and loyalty, this 
big words that the financial sector is talking about. Now, when it comes to your particular institution that we are looking at right now, before we move on to your position in the state bank as well, but <coughs> when it comes to your company, we have seen this company growing over the past uh, few years. What is different with Janashakti? Uh, Janashakti was started 25 years ago. It was started by my father. He had a burning desire to start a life insurance company. He was an insurer himself for the 25 years or more prior to that. And he saw a need for a dedicated life insurance company. So with that in mind, with meager resources, he didn't have huge capital. Um, he set up the company and he saw it as a means of spreading the message of life insurance to every nook and cranny in the country. The strong plus points of Jana Shakti are, I think, the lamp logo and the name. The logo is symbolic to every religion in the country. It is symbolic to every community in this country. Similarly, the name Jana Shakti. Every, it, it appeals to both the major languages. And I think that helped us to establish our presence over the years. It helped us to build a brand image which, which is exceptionally strong and known across the length and breadth of the country. So, the LAMP logo and the name itself symbolize and probably convey the message of trust. And that combined with our commitment, I mean, as a family, as a business entity, as a leadership team, we were always committed to this. Um, we wanted to be financially strong and convey the message that here is a company that you can rely upon, that you can trust, that will be fair by its customers come the crunch time when there is a payment of a claim due. And we've tried to live by that over the years. We are cutting into a breaking news telecast. The expenditure head of the Ministry of Megapolis and Western Development was defeated in Parliament a short while ago with 38 MPs voting against and only 24 MPs voting in favour. Earlier in the evening, the expenditure head of the Ministry of Internal and Home Affairs, Provincial Councils and Local Government was also defeated with 38 MPs voting against and only 20 MPs voting in favour. Taking a look at that once again, the expenditure head of the Ministry of Megapolis and Western Development was defeated in Parliament a short while ago with 30 MP, 38 rather, MPs voting against and only 24 MPs voting in favour. Come back. Uh, we were in discussion with Mr. Prakash Shafter. Before we went into the break, we spoke to him about Jana Shakti Insurance and the question was, why is Jana Shakti Insurance different? Now, at the outset, I promised you that we'll be talking several topics today and uh, one such topic is Sri Lanka cricket. Uh, Mr. Shafter has been uh, the secretary when yes. two interim, uh, for two interim uh, bodies uh, when it was appointed back in the day. So I want to uh, ask you, Mr. Shafter, all the attention uh, with regard to Sri Lanka cricket is now drawn towards the management of Sri Lanka cricket, be it corruption related, be it mismanagement related, everyone is looking at Sri Lanka cricket at the moment. And every time the team fails um, in the ground, whatever tournament it is, the Sri Lanka cricket management is being held accountable. For the right reasons, for the wrong reasons, people can argue. What is your point? I think you put, really put me on the spot and I must say, Navigating through the questions you possibly will ask me about Sri Lanka cri cricket would be more difficult than answering questions with re regard to business. Um, well, I wish I can put my finger on what exactly ails Sri Lanka cricket, but like with most corporate entities, I think if the team is not performing well, the management of Sri Lanka cricket has to take, up, uh, take responsibility in the final analysis. And the fact is that the team has not been performing well in the last couple of years at least. Um, there are many reasons for it and I think it would be unfair for me to pin it on one or the yeah. individual. Yes. But it requires a great deal of introspection to look into, look into and ask oneself what is it that we can do to improve our cricket. We have also done a few uh, research, let me call it for, the, uh, for story purposes. And what we found is every time a competent authority rather than a proper management of Sri Lanka cricket was functioning at
Sri Lanka cricket. The team has performed well outside uh, whatever tournament they were playing. So there seems to be a direct link between the two. Uh, we cannot. Do you have anything to add to that? Because uh, the the it's absolutely clear that every time there was a competent authority there, the team has been performing well. Um, well, I'm not done the analysis myself, but if you say so, I would accept it. Um, the challenge that Sri Lanka cricket has is that the governing body is an elected body mm. and if you look at the electoral uh, electoral setup you've got almost something like 140 odd votes with about 80 odd clubs and provincial associations and district associations voting so unfortunately when elections are due or well prior to elections, you have a lot of politicking and canvassing which takes place because there are different aspirants mm. to, uh, to this process. So therefore, when a process of politicking and elections takes place, you naturally have, uh, shall I say, aspects which creep into this process which would probably corrupt the system. Right. Uh, so it is not that the most deserving or the best candidates are eventually selected yeah. because the fact remains that there are many candidates, many worthy administrators who do not want to be part of a politicking process and therefore opt out. Let me ask the flip side of that question. Now, you have been a part of the competent authority as a secretary. Why did you not contest for the SLC elections, maybe to get a position uh, at uh, as the management of Sri Lanka cricket, whatever position it may be? See, I'm not saying my, the stand that I took is right or wrong, but to me personally, I did not enjoy going and canvassing and ask or uh, requesting clubs and associations to vote for me mm. or for the team that I stood with. Yes. Uh, for me, this was an association, and if you're good enough, you needed to hold office. And it, it becomes almost cutthroat. Election, having an election is fine, but when uh, candidates are dead set on get, holding office at any cost, then I felt that I did not want to be a part of that process. Mr. Shafter, final question about Sri Lanka cricket. I want to move on, but I want to ask you this question uh, because we've had from time to time various exposes with regard to Sri Lanka cricket from the past. Uh, and all those instances reveal that there has been serious financial mismanagement as well. Now, we are not talking about individuals who are uh, not competent about the financial industry as a whole. Uh, people who are there, are businessmen, politicians, people who are un who have uh, understanding about the financial situation. Why do you think that there is this vast financial mismanagement at somewhere like Sri Lanka cricket in all places? Sri Lanka cricket is unfortunately the only or the main newsworthy sport, and unfortunately is in the public eye. Mm. So things are sometimes or uh, things are sometimes magnified way beyond. What is, re what is the reality. I am um, not necessarily saying that there has been gross financial mismanagement there. Uh, finances could have been handled better. Maybe administrations from time to time have mismanaged finances. But I don't think there has been large-scale fraud as sometimes made out. Uh, certainly we have to look at the governance standards which apply and, the, and uh, better systems have to be introduced. Because it's all part of the election process. I mean, when, when you are canvassing for votes, then you are making promises to your constituency which you've got to deliver on. So then you're giving handouts when you probably need not give. You're, you're probably, uh, shall I say, employing people whom you shouldn't do as coaches or whatever it is, purely because you have to repay a favor or repay a promise. Mr. Shafter, let's stop talking about Sri Lanka cricket for a while and let's get back to uh, your new position at a state bank, the Bank of Ceylon. Uh, now, from the insurance field on to the state bank sector, why the jump? Or oh, is it a jump? <laughs> well, uh, insurance and banks are both in the wider financial services sector, so I would say it's uh, not a jump, it's just a, a hop. Um, well, when I was asked whether I wanted to be a director at the Bank of Ceylon, I pondered upon it because uh, it is not a decision that I took lightly, especially considering the controversies that sometimes surround state institutions. And uh, on reflection, I felt that I had worked in the private sector in Sri Lanka for close to 20, 25 years um, and, been and been a director in a few institutions. And I felt that uh, I could bring my private sector experience to bear 
in the Bank of Ceylon. Mm. Uh, and I felt I could make a positive contribution to what is the possibly the largest uh, state-owned financial institution in the country. Yeah. At the same time, I felt that I did not have any exposure to working in the public sector and I felt that it would give me to a learning experience of going, understanding how a government sector organization would work. Mm. And I am hopeful that uh, I would learn in the months to come and similarly that I would be able to positively contribute to the bank's progress. Uh, when it comes, as you uh, mentioned, uh, working at a state bank, attention uh, from the media, attention from the political sphere, attention from even private entities are directly drawn towards the two, uh, three state banks that we have uh, operating in the country. And a uh, person with your caliber, your, <coughs> my bigger part, your caliber, your work experience, and at the end of the day, your name, Prakash Shaft, is a very famous name in industry. When it goes from the insurance agency, insurance sector rather, to the banking sector, do you think there will be a positive uh, outlook on the company that you represent or do you think there will be an impact or how do you see it? You are being very complimentary to me. Uh, I'm hopeful that I mean, my primary employment is as chairman of Jan Shakti Insurance and in every decision that I make with regard to appointments or other matters, I've got to be conscious that it does not have a negative impact on my company, which I work for because they are yes. my employer after all. And I think that in by my being associated with the Bank of Ceylon, I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably certain there is a positive impact, provided there is no scandal which I have to get embroiled in, and I'm certainly hopeful that that won't happen. Mr. Shafter, let's get back to the insurance industry uh, for a while. A question that I just got on my phone uh, from a viewer is the fact that I just want to ask you about the numbers. Now, uh, with time going on, people have had uh, various opinions about life obtaining a life insurance and uh, the wider opinion sometimes is negative, sometimes is positive. Uh, with regard to the numbers uh, in the insurance industry, is there a positive trend, is there a negative trend? Because a normal person watching from home wouldn't be aware of such information. When you talk to me about positive trend, you're talking about the premium income or the yes. sales numbers. Yeah. Well, if you look at the in the last five or ten years, the life insurance industry, which I'm a part of, has been growing quite rapidly. I would think the growth is, is uh, in double-digit figures year on year. So if you're having a double-digit growth, that's quite healthy. Yeah. And I think I, I can't say business is not good. But having said that, if you ask me about the potential for life insurance, we certainly have a vast potential. If you look at the insured population as a percentage of the insurable population, it is not as high as it should be. If you look at the premium income as a percentage of our GDP, it is lower than most of our South Asian neighbors, certainly way lower than most of our Southeast Asian countries. So it is, on the one hand, an indication that there is a lot of potential for insurance in Sri Lanka. So we need to make the most of that opportunity. On the other hand, if you ask me, we as insurers need to take responsibility for the fact that we have not grown the industry to the extent that we should have. With that, uh, Mr. Shafter, we have to go in for a short commercial break. We will be right back. News First, Newsline Prime with Araz Shaukatali. Welcome back. You're watching Newsline Prime with me, not Farah Shaukatali, this evening. Uh, we are in discussion with Mr. Prakash Shafter and we spoke about Sri Lanka cricket, we spoke about his new position as a board member of POC and we of course spoke about spoke to him about the insurance sector as a whole and uh, Mr. Shafter just before we went into the break uh, spoke about the numbers with regard to the insurance sector so I want to uh, continue uh, from that point. Now Mr. Shafter, it's understood that as you mentioned uh, the insurance sector, the number of people who should be insured uh, is below uh, the number that is uh, considered a good amount. Uh, now, when it comes to our country, uh, we have a lot of players in the insurance industry as well. Uh, but is it something wrong with the competition that you all have or is it the understand lack of understanding amongst the general public? Where is the problem with regard to the number of or the less number of people who are insured? If I, people often ask me this question, both uh, people, non-insurance people and people from uh, the insurance industry abroad. And my answer is that if I knew the problem, I would have fixed it a long time ago <laughs> and been much more successful at what I'm doing. Um, we yet, I yet don't have, and I think as an industry, we don't have a 
the right answer as to what the problem is. But if you ask me, I think it is partly to do with the fact that we are an island. We are, and if you are in an island, you are usually laid back, easy going. So the first thing is that people think, okay, nothing will happen to me. Or I don't really need to insure because it, the insurance is necessarily for someone else, but I don't think anything is going to happen to me type mm. of thing. The other thing is that there is a fair percentage of our population which is below the poverty line. Just because you're above the poverty line doesn't mean that you can afford insurance. So there is a fair segment of our po population which, to be fair, cannot afford to buy insurance in their, in their personal names. Mm. So that is the next issue which you have. Even if you look at the insurance policies which are sold, roughly 40 to 50 percent of the policies which are sold lapse within the first year. That means the customer takes a policy, he pays the first premium and then he may pay a couple more premiums if it's monthly premiums, but he doesn't see it through to a year. So it means that people are not, I mean it's a lot, partly to do with insurance companies where the sales agent does not convey the right information to the client or he is pressurizing the client to buy a policy and the client buys a policy when he really doesn't want to buy it. Mm. The other factor is also that clients don't see much value in buying insurance and continuing it. Usually they look for what is my return at the end of the period, not for what is the risk that I avoid by Buy. buying insurance. Because in life insurance in its original pure form was insurance against the risk of death. It was not really meant to pay you money at the end of a period. Now we have a hybrid now where it not only pays you some money at the end of a term but also provides you a lump sum in the event of death, which is fine. What happens is the customer sometimes tends to look more at how much he gets at the end of the term rather than what he gets or what his family would get in the event he dies. Mr. Shaf, now when it comes to this particular problem, as you uh, touched upon this as well, the disposable income of uh, the general public, as you mentioned, uh, people wouldn't really necessarily have the enough, enough money uh, to purchase uh, insurance policy from a company. This issue, doesn't it reflect on the economy as a whole? Well, I'm not saying that nobody can afford to buy it. There is a large segment of the uh, Sri Lankan uh, public which cannot afford to buy insurance. Yes, and yes, it does reflect on the state of the economy. But I think that the prosperity levels of our people have been improving over the years. Mm -hmm. We are close to $4,000. We are somewhere there. And I'm sure we will ju we'll jump $4,000 hopefully in the near future. And. Uh, I think prosperity levels are increasing. I hope they continue to, go, to grow at a faster rate and it has to be combined with uh, income distribution. The distribution of income probably can be more even. Mr. Tav, now uh, you are now in the Bank of Ceylon as well, so this question becomes uh, relevant. Uh, if you take a look at the commercial banks in the country at the moment, they are not performing so well in terms of their balance sheets, uh, but the insurance industry, as you said, is doing okay. and. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, the people also uh, have a problem with regard to their disposable income and the cost of living keeps on increasing. So with the political sphere operating on uh, one hand, how important is the economic stability for both your industries now as an insurance uh, personality and as a banking personality? Okay, um, economic stability is an absolute prerequisite for any business because stability with regard to policy stability with regard to the economy, the framework within which we operate, all of that is an absolute necessity for any business. And insurance is no different to any other business. Um, Sri Lanka, unfortunately, is not as stable as far as policy is concerned, as, as much as we would like it to be. I think we would like a more stable policy. But on the other hand, having been in business for the, in Sri Lanka for the last 25 years, I think most businesses are used to the shall I say, roller coaster ride that we have. Mm. And uh, people learn to adjust. It's the ability to adjust and, and make the best of difficult situations. You're in the state sector as well, but if I uh, bring out this argument that the private companies in our country uh, do a lot of work to hold the economy uh, and the government can do more, is that an argument that can be uh, dealt with? Well, I would think that the private sector does do a lot to hold the economy together as you put it or at least I would say to drive the economy forward. 
we would always look for greater support from the government, but I'm not sure there is a right formula. Mm. Certainly the government has a role to play in aiding the private sector, and the private sector has to ensure that we do our bit to, uh, to ensure economic growth of the country. Uh, Mr. Shafter, again, with regard to people not buying insurance policies from companies. Now, people who are receiving a salary above a certain threshold would be uh, subject to various taxes in our country. And uh, taxation is a problem we at News First have also been uh, speaking, for, uh, speaking about for a long time. How do you think the taxation implies on the insurance industry and the banking industry? You're really putting me on the spot. Uh, taxes, I think, are something that nobody would really want to pay and like to pay, but I think it's, it's something which we, are, which we have to pay. Uh, the state has certain expenses. Uh, they have to be funded. We have obligations by the less fortunate in society, mm. and that has to be funded from corporates and from individuals who are well-to-do. At a personal level, I've got absolutely no problem with that. Where I do have an issue is the way that is spent. Absolutely. Uh, I would like to see far greater efficiency in how the money that is collected from taxpayers is spent. If the private sector efficiency can be introduced into that spending, I think you would get far more value for the money that we pay as taxes and I think people will resent paying taxes far less. Certainly I would be happier to pay taxes if I knew the money was well spent. Now, Mr. Chapter, with time running out, I want to draw a question to you as a person. Citizen Shafter, not insurance uh, personality or a banking personality. My question is very simple. You brought us to an interesting point with regard to the taxation point as well. Now, if you are working at a private company, you as the head of your institution would make sure your company operates uh, with transparency, your company would operate uh, to earn those profits in uh, a manner that is right, correct, but when it comes to the country as a whole, the exact opposite is being done by the people who hold power. And you have, a, you have been a person who has been away from the country and who has come back to give something to the country, back to start a business. And obviously, uh, you are giving employment to people, all sorts of things. But how do you feel as a citizen of this country with regard to how the politicians of this country are working? Citizen Shafter may not have the courage to say what needs to be said. But uh, certainly, I mean, it's not a secret. The, uh, corruption exists in this country. Um, corruption exists, I think, in most South Asian countries, unfortunately. And uh, I wish corruption were lesser than it is. It's not something that any one of us like to deal with. Um, as far as corporates are concerned, you get corporates which have high principles of governance and uh, act within certain rules and certain framework. You get corporates which act outside of this framework. It's not that all corporates mm. are clean and yeah. Uh, don't sully their hands. It's just that some do, some don't, and I hope that more are clean than dirty. Um, I wouldn't say that all politicians are corrupt, but I would think unfortunately most politicians are corrupt. And again, the system lends itself to that because if you look at it, if I've got to run an election campaign, it's fairly costly. So where does that money come from? Unless I'm a very, very rich individual who's prepared to put my money on the table and spend for all of it and uh, spend for the campaign, spend for all my supporters who have to give up their normal day-to-day -day work and run with me, uh, where do I get the money from? And if, even if I put my money, the question is then what do I get in return? Am I prepared to keep coughing up this money on a regular basis? So I think it's the system itself. We've really got to look at the political system, the electoral system and see how you can tinker with that. Mr. Shafter, thank you very much for being here with us this evening and talking to us about Several topics uh, ranging from the finance uh, sector to Sri Lanka cricket and as his conclu concluding remark, uh, the political situation in the country as well. That was Mr. Prakash Shafter speaking to us exclusively first time on Newsline and once again uh, we hope Farah Shaukat Ali will get well soon and come here uh, for the show tomorrow. I've been Chaturang Kapwariti. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good day.